Well, hello. I didn't see you there. I was too busy celebrating International Women's Day with a sparkling glass of water. What's your name? I'm Elaine, and this is Elaine is XYZ. While you're here, why don't you let me tell you about some of the kick ass women that you should know and be talking about this Women's History Month? And why, yes, I am dressed in suffragette white for the occasion. Thanks for noticing. So, yes. International Women's Day, which at least if you're in the United States is part of Women's History Month. It's an initiative to, well, celebrate women, I guess, put them in the spotlight, so to speak. As with all these kind of tokenized days, though, it's experienced quite a brand overhaul from its original beginnings. With International Women's Day especially, they've taken an event that was supposed to be very activist and anti-capitalist and made it into this kind of fun but empty corporate pat on the backathon, Which is frustrating considering there's so much more work to do to guarantee equality and also a little disheartening considering IWD as it is now would probably have its founder rolling over in her grave. Because you see, IWD was founded by Clara Zetkin, the leader of the Communist Party in Germany. Clara Zetkin was a fiery and brave communist who, amongst other stories, traveled 1,000 miles from Moscow to Berlin to open up the German parliamentary session with a 40-minute f*** you to the Nazi party. She was 75 at the time. Unfortunately, she died soon after and, well, you know what the Nazis did. But in her memory, I want to kind of take International Women's Day back to its roots and feature some women who were activists and organizers for equality on all fronts. Making fields fertile for the growth of future women's health, happiness, and engagement in traditionally male-dominated spaces. And since this has come up again and again since I made my last video about Asian American violence, I'm going to focus on Asian American women who were activists. Because it turns out very few people seem to think that there are such things as activist Asians. Hmm. Actually, there are many AAPI out there who are doing very, very radical things. You just don't hear about them outside of AAPI circles because, well, since it doesn't fit into the model minority stereotype, it might as well not exist. In fact, it seems like the only activist that anyone has actually heard of is the Asians who go around protesting affirmative action at Ivy League schools. Because yeah, us wanting to secure education for our own fits very well into the model minority narrative. But that erases everyone who has fought for all racial equality, alleviating poverty, equity and pay, unsegregating spaces, and a whole host of other progressive ideals that Asian Americans have been a part of since the beginning. It's truly shocking when you look into it how invisible we are. So yes, I'm going to bring to the stage five Asian American women you should try to learn more about this Women's History Month. Let's start with one of the earliest Asian American activists, Mabel Pinghua Lee. Born in 1887 in Guangzhou, she moved to America when she was nine because of a academic scholarship. Her family lived in New York City's Chinatown, and by the time she was 16 years old, Mabel was already deeply involved in activism and women's rights. On May 4th, 1912, she led a suffrage parade in New York City that garnered almost 10,000 people. And mind you, she was fighting for women's suffrage, even though, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, 
Even if women won the right to vote, she still wouldn't be able to. You see, the Chinese Exclusion Act basically said that Chinese men or women had no chance of naturalizing as American citizens. In fact, when the amendment was passed in 1920, she was actually still without voting rights. She did, though, graduate from Columbia, becoming the first Chinese woman to obtain a PhD in economics. And she continued to stay in the United States for the next 45 years until her death. So, at the very least, she did live long enough to see Asian American men and women vote in America after the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943. For number two, let's explore Hawaii and Pacific Islanders with Helen Lake Kanahele. Helen was an American labor organizer from Kona, Hawaii, who became the president of the and I'm going to have to read this out. Women's Auxiliary of the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union. <sighs> That's quite a mouthful. And she also worked with the United Public Workers Union. As a kid, she had a talent for singing and dancing hula and was already going on tours throughout the world before she turned seven. By age 12, she was assisting in political campaigns by the Democratic Party. It was during her work for the Dems that she became introduced to labor unions and began participating in strikes for better rights for dock workers. Her work in union organizing and her other pet cause, abolishing the death penalty, put her on the radar of the Subversive Activities Control Board, a US government initiative to investigate communist infiltration into American society. Ooh, red scare. She wasn't intimidated by them though, and went on to work in the unions for years and years afterwards. All right, for number three. This lady is one of the most famous Asian American activists out there already, but I figure what Asian Americans find famous doesn't seem to be what the mainstream always finds famous, so I'm giving her a platform anyways. Let's talk Yuri Kochiyama. Kochiyama's campaign for the rights of black people, Latino people, native people, and Asian American people for almost her entire life. She was one of the many Japanese families rounded up and forced into internment camps during World War II. After World War II, she moved with her husband to the housing projects of New York City and began holding weekly open houses for activists in her apartment. She began working on black nationalism with Malcolm X after they met in 1963, and they were such good friends that actually she was there to cradle him in her lap after he was gunned down during his last speech in 1965. In the 1980s, she was instrumental in the movement pushing for reparations and a formal apology to Japanese Americans for the internment camps, which President Reagan signed into law in 1988. She lived to be 93 years old. For number four, another long-lived activist and one of my personal heroes, Grace Lee Boggs. Originally from Rhode Island, Boggs studied at Barnard College and Bryn Mawr, getting a PhD in philosophy and studying the writings of Marx, Hegel, and Margaret Mead. Unsurprisingly, considering her reading material and the opportunities available to Chinese American academic women at the time, zero, nada, she moved away from academia and into activism. She began by fighting for tenants' rights in Chicago and moved into increasingly leftist organizations, ending up at something called the Johnson Forest Tendency, a group that believed in workers' self-activity, in which people organize and emancipate themselves. Even after she left that group, she retained her core principle that revolution was a process and that revolutionaries need to be well-organized, well-read, and disciplined in order to see it through. I think this is why she's such an inspiration to me, actually. Sometimes, with all of the shouting that goes around in the left, 
It can be really exhausting and demoralizing to be demanded over and over again to prove your purity in the movement. But Boggs was actually adamant that dogmaticism actually destroys revolutions. She said, and I quote, Reality is constantly changing, and we must be wary of becoming stuck in ideas that have come out of past experiences and have lost their usefulness in the struggle to create the future. Boggs was involved somehow in just about every civil rights event, including MLK Jr.'s Great Walk to Freedom and Malcolm X's Message from the Grassroots speech, and she spent her later years specifically working to make Detroit, her hometown, a better place through a whole bunch of community-based activist initiatives. She lived to be 100 years old. Not only do I want to be her when I grow up, I also want to grow up that long. <laughs> Finally, let's end on an issue that I've been reading more about recently and have been shocked and saddened by. The extra amount of erasure that Southeast Asians face in mainstream media. I know that I've unwittingly participated in this myself. Being East Asian, when we do have the rare chance to talk about AAPI issues, we tend to dominate the stage and the conversation. And that leaves very, very little space for people from the Philippines, from Thailand, from Indonesia, from Vietnam, Laos, and the like. In fact, when I tried to do my part to remedy this by searching for Southeast Asian American women who've been activists in history, I was appalled by how little was written about them on the internet. So today, I'm going to highlight one woman who has worked to change that for the Filipino American community, which, did you know, are actually the second largest Asian American population in America? and have had a presence in America since before the Declaration of Independence. Probably not, because almost nobody talks about Filipino American history, even though it was such an integral chunk of America as a whole. One woman working to change that was Don Bohulano Mabalong, who amongst other things co-founded the Little Manila Foundation to save Little Manila in Stockton, California and she was documenting the legacy of Filipino Americans up until her very untimely death in 2018. Her 2013 book, Little Manila is the Heart, showcased how Filipinos contributed to the fertility and economy of central California's verdant farmland, including turning Stockton into such a vibrant community that Filipino love ballads actually made it to being recorded by some of the superstars in the day, such as Nat King Cole singing Dahil Sayo. Dahil Sayo. Nice come my boo high. Unfortunately, Stockton was all but destroyed when California decided to build a byway straight through it. Because, you know, property rights and nimbyism only works for people who are not brown. Mabalan was working on a biography of revolutionary farm worker organizer Larry Itilong when she died suddenly of an asthma attack on vacation. Her death leaves a deep hole for Filipino Americans trying to record their own history, and I do hope that somebody fills it. But she left a quote that I think could be applied to any of us Asian Americans or allies trying to share more about American history, because it's true about any of our ethnicities. 
We've given to the major social movements that changed this nation, sacrificed so much so that workers today can have a living wage and better working conditions. And if we knew that, that could be so inspiring for all of us to think of the different things that we could do in our lives, no matter how humble or ordinary or poor we are. So that's what I'll leave you with this International Women's Day. If you found this useful, please like and subscribe. You can find me off of YouTube on my Instagram or website. And happy Women's History Month. Go out there and, I don't know, hashtag choose to challenge yourself to learn something about women and activism and something in that general sphere. Catch you next time doing whatever it is I happen to be doing.